Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to the most exciting PCI case of the past year webinar from the Cardiovascular Innovations. Um, thank you all for joining us tonight. This is the first webinar for this year, and uh, we look forward to lots of learning. We have um, a CME accreditation for this that you can claim going to the CVI Solutions website. And we have a tremendous faculty with us today, uh, Dr. Chadri Alres from Detroit, Dr. Lorenzo Azzalini from the University of Washington in Seattle, and uh, Dr. Catherine Kankel from the Piedmont Heart Institute in Atlanta. And the disclosures are all listed on the slides. As I mentioned before, you can have the CME at the end of the meeting. And we would like to thank our sponsors, which are Abbott Laboratories, Medtronic, and Shockwave. And this is the link. Again, if you go to CVI Innovations website, you can find <clears> it. <throat> and uh, let me remind everyone for uh, the CVI 2024 meeting, July 18 to 20, it's back in Denver. Uh, it's going to be much better weather, much cooler, and we look forward to a lot of great science with uh, TED-style talks and a lot of interaction. So again, we'd love to uh, get started. Uh, we'll go alphabetically this year, so to some extent. So we'll start with Dr. Uh, Alres. So Chadi, thanks again for being with us today. And um, we look forward to discussing with your cases. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Perlakis, for the invitation. Really delighted to be here. Uh, the title is very interesting, and I think uh, hopefully we'll come up with some interesting point of them from these cases. Uh, I have no disclosures. So this is a very interesting 29-year-old man presented uh, with one-week history of nausea and vomiting. When he presented to the emergency department, he has uh, stated that he's trying to get detox from his chronic use of Xanax. His blood pressure is 128 over 90, heart rate 110. Lab were unremarkable except some AKI, and eventually troponin came back positive. Uh, my elevated at more than 5,000. This is a high sensitivity troponin. Because of these findings and because he never complained in a chest pain, that that's triggered the EKG, the 12 day EKG. Um, as you can see there, there is a very remarkable ST elevation, almost diffuse everywhere. Uh, you can argue that this is uh, can be pericarditis, but you cannot ignore that this is J point elevation, suggesting so true ST elevation and mainly of precordial and lateral knee. Because of these findings, the patient was given aspirin and loaded with ticagrelor and the STEMI pager was activated to bring the patient to the cath lab. And just curious, Sadi, would, would anyone, uh, uh, Catherine or, or Lorenzo, would any of you just uh, hold tight on this patient and do an echo or do some more interactions, or would you just uh, be uniformly um, agreeing of just bringing the patient to the cath lab? I have a really low threshold to cath these patients. I think a diagnostic radial catheterization costs you very little even if the diagnosis ultimately ends up being Takotsubo or something like that, you can make the diagnosis really fast and reassure everyone. And I just find that these can kind of be like a nail biting white knuckle moment, just sitting in the unit. Should I do them? Should I not? I just personally prefer to just knock it out. Yeah, there's no question that uh, this patient should get a cath. The main question may be you know, like a, treat like a STEMI or uh, do some kind of workup, like maybe you can do an echocardiogram in the ER while you're waiting for the cath lab team to go, uh, to come in. But uh, yeah, it doesn't look too reassuring to me. So probably I would have cath this patient um, urgently, if not emergently. And it's okay. funny you mentioned that because what, the, the way it was mentioned, I was driving back home on Sunday morning after finishing round, and they said, we have this guy, we don't know what's going on, take a look at his EKG. So I drove back and saw him, he just was throwing up, he wasn't complaining of chest pain, but the EKG was concerning enough, as Catherine mentioned, maybe just take him and take a look. So the, the, the course kind of deteriorated from there right away. As we're pushing him to the cath lab, the patient became very hypoxic, agitated, um, and they intubated him in the emergency room. From there, he went to the V-fib cardiac arrest, CPR for two cycles, shot two times, and loaded with epinephrine and levo as we're transferring him to the cath lab table. And that's kind of lead, led us that this is most likely a true cardiac event leading to his uh, troponin elevation and the ST changes we saw it there. So this is the angiogram as you see from the left side, we have uh, an AP view showing uh, left main is fine, but there is a 
a big filling defect involving the LAD, especially the proximal segment, very long um, a thrombotic lesion, most likely, and in the most likely differential, as well as Timmy one flow, not even reaching the mid LAD. The circumflex, as you see there, or the high OM, as you see it there as well, is not filling well, and there is a definitely a filling defect. Because of this heavy thrombus burden, we uh, he was already receiving heparin. We bolused him with Tarifi band, which is our 2 p 3 n inhibitor in the cath lab. And uh, from there, as you see, the arteries are very smooth. I couldn't tell if there is a black rupture, especially for somebody 29 and with this diffuse disease. Off note, the RCA shot uh, before this and is showing completely open RCA. So we start to balloon and we're doctoring mainly the wire and eventually ballooning to get some flow into the LAD. And the patient during that episode, he has multiple runs of VFib requiring shock to bring him back. Um, Again, more ballooning uh, to trying to, I tried to protect also the circumflex slash OM just to make sure that there is no uh, retrograde dislodgement of this heavy clot backward to the left main. So I just tried to protect the, the, LA, the circumflex and the OM with the, with the wire, but also uh, uh, make sure of, uh, to get some flow to the distal circumflex. And just curious, uh, Charlie, so again, obviously great uh, management and patience with this. Uh, just curious, would people sometimes go with a, penumbra or some sort of aspiration when you have this massive amount of clot or you think it's unlikely to be able to retrieve it given the size and the and the location and plus there's the risk of stroke when you're coming back to get clot thrown on the, into the order yeah yeah i think it's a it's a relevant point man it's particularly in a patient like this one that we think he, he doesn't have any uh rupture plaque maybe it's just embolic so it's better probably to suck it out entirely um another question that I would like to pose to Chadi is that, I mean, this guy uh, was on two pressors before the procedure and there is a huge thrombotic burden. There is high risk of no reflow. Any thought about putting a MCS device, for, for example, in Pella up front or during the case? It's a very good point. As you know, from uh, the door, door to unload trials and in terms of patient with shock, definitely this is a shock patient and we don't know as of now, we don't know what's his EF and what's his LVEDP. Definitely your argue can go ahead. But the fact that he was coding and because of the finding of the angiogram, I was uh, worried as to kind of get some flow and eventually transition. When I get some flow, I'm going to go ahead and put MCS on him. But I was still puzzled at this point uh, to why this patient had this heavy clots. Where is it coming from? What's the source? Unlikely to be uh, for somebody 29. And uh, he admitted that he's taking Xanax, but he did not admit for any cocaine. And I never seen a cocaine that caused that much of what. To Manu's point, uh, thrombectomy, as you mentioned, and there is a comment also in the chat box talking about would you do thrombectomy from the beginning before ballooning? Uh, with the concern that Manus mentioned of the stroke, uh, kind of uh, especially the taste trial and other trials, uh, that I just did ballooning and eventually I had no choice but to go with thrombectomy. And this is the CAT RX uh, continuous thrombectomy, aspiration thrombectomy catheter. Uh, so it doesn't lose negative pressure. It can maintain minus 29 or minus 30 throughout the aspiration. As you advance it over the 1-4 wire all the way distal and you pull it out as you are aspirating all the way to come, until you come out from the guide. And for sure, yeah. we, we aspirated a good amount of clots. You know, I will, I would say with the, the penumbra, I, you know, I wish I could say that that was my end all be all catheter, you know, that I really could get a lot of organized clot out, but I just find that, you know, especially, the, I mean, the clot that you showed was so large and organized. I just feel like upfront, I would be pessimistic that a penumbra would make a, a huge difference on that. And I, actually feel like sometimes I'll use do three or four passes of penumbra get really not very much and go to export um you know go back to old school I don't know if other operators have that experience kind of failing with penumbra and then making some progress with export well export you can go seven friends right so the advantage is you can actually get a bigger one if you have a seven friends guy now this seems to be radial so you might be a little more limited in the size but i agree with you and the other option is to also use potentially guide extension deep engage it inside the coronary artery and then try to aspirate through the tui and sometimes you can get some big clots out like that but i agree there's no perfect solution for this large thrombi 
And what I've done a couple times, which again always makes me nervous, is take this uh, devices made for brain thrombectomy that uh, can it's actually like me uh, metallic, me it's nitinol messes. You put them in and then you deploy them and the clot gets trapped and you pull it out. But I always get a little nervous because you might dislodge something which could then travel and cause other problems. So there are some solutions, you know, inside the box and out of the box, but it's always a big challenge. 100%. And uh, just to continue with this aspiration findings, as once we're done aspirating, we found that, as you see, the left side, the LAD start to get some flow all the way to the apex, but definitely the OM, large OM, uh, is still kind of very slow flow and the clot's still there. We were not, I did not do a, th a thrombectomy on that vessel itself. So in order to understand the mechanism, and I know maybe this is not the right time to do imaging, but I just wanted to understand, is this something I need to stent? Is there a, a plaque rupture? Uh, again, he's 29, uh, unlikely to have a CAD. So I did perform um, IVUS, and you see it there on the pullback from the uh, LAD on the right side of the panel. That's pulling, as you see, there's nothing really, um, any um, atherosclerotic disease, and just uh, kind of remaining clots in the vessel confirming that this mechanism most likely is a thromboembolic event uh, or acute um, a coronary thrombo thrombosis more than uh, a plaque rupture. Now, just to confirm, again, going to um, uh, Lorenzo uh, point is about the mechanical support. Giving the, the, I did some hemodynamics, so we did a right heart cat, and uh, you can see it there, it's almost like a Takotsubo phenomena with, with a completely akinetic apex. And with, you cannot argue, I cannot tell from this angiogram personally, but I, there is must be, maybe there is some akinesis and possibly mural thrombus laying down in the LV. ADP was 30, 42, MAP was 60, RA was 21, and wedge pressure was 27, cardiac output was uh, 2.9, and the index 1.7 on, on Levo, Mildreno, uh, Levo and Epi, and SVR 1100, CPO 0.5, and PAPI 0.7. So with these hemodynamics, we are reassured that this is something somebody need mechanical support. And another thing is going to make it without without it. But the fact that there's a concern about the LV thrombus, I was hesitant to put an impella there because this is a black box, box warning to in this situation. Anybody has any thoughts about what what to do next and about these hemodynamics? Well, I mean the the, the LV thrombus issue can be solved with a bedside echo in less than five minutes. Uh, I think this patient definitely needs support left-sided first. And, uh, you know, while keeping him in the lab after like half an hour or so, repeat the right cath, see if the um, RV um, catches up. If not, uh, you might need also uh, right-sided support. Uh, at that point, you might argue our Impella RP or Protect Duo or ECMO. Uh, but uh, yeah, this is not an easy situation. And I think that uh, also for this chemiary perfusion injury, um, he would be much better off with the MCS. Um, I don't know what uh, Catherine and, and Manus think. Yeah, I mean, I think I just applaud you for doing the VGRAM in this situation. I am not a huge performer of VGRAMs in this sort of a situation because we do have echo and can save contrast. But when you have that much thrombus in the LAD, my, I'm immediately going to, do we have an LV thrombus? And, you know, Lorenzo is very lucky. I certainly do not have access to, like, within five to ten minutes on a Sunday, you know, a Sunday morning bedside echo with contrast and things like that. Like, I, I don't have that. It's me with an ultrasound probe and a tech driving in from home. So, um, you know, but I think a well-done VGRAM with a power injector can really answer if you have a mobile apical thrombus. So um, I would have done the exact same thing in this situation. Well, I think in our place, a patient like this will go straight to ECMO. Uh, I think, you know, you have a such low index. It's unclear, it's right, left, but I mean, the filling pressures are extremely high. The oxygenation issues from what I remember before uh, with um, the patient. Uh, and, and I agree, I think probably put him on ECMO to stabilize them and then, to, Lorenzo, to Lorenzo's point, who needs some afterload reduction, so then you might need an impella, so um, like a capella or sometimes a balloon pump, but yeah, I think definitely some support would be required. And an interesting thought that came from around from the audience, which actually it's a possibility, is about COVID. You know, sometimes during COVID, we saw this massive amounts of thrombus. I don't know if this patient doesn't, doesn't seem like he had a uh, history of... Uh, 
uh, any issues with uh, infection, but there might be another cause of potentially having the, uh, such a, such important uh, clot. Right. So uh, because of the, uh, we have we have been having a hard time oxygenating him. He was saturating in the 80s, uh, despite FiO2 being on 100. Uh, so as to, to, to the panel point is he require mechanical support because of the oxygenation issue, as well as the uh, shock situation, we did cannulate him for VA ECMO. Um, definitely he, his course wasn't very pleasant. He ended up with AKI, a shock liver. He was in the CCU for 27 days, intubated, ended up with tracheostomy. And he developed uh, kind of, uh, I think, because of the beginning high dose uh, inotrope uh, finger and digit ischemia, he ended up with uh, losing few digits from his hand and few digits from his uh, fruit toes as well. Uh, but eventually was uh, transferred to LTAC, where he was uh, vent weaned. And eventually, three months after discharge from LTAC, that's six months post the index admission, his EF is 40%. And he was um, uh, mentally functional and neurologically functional. Well, wow, that's a that's a big save. And uh, did you ever figure out the cause of it? Did you have like a PFO, any DVT? Did it ever become uh, clear what caused caused it in the first place? Uh, not really. I mean, and the problem is, it's a very tragic story because on the day five of his hospitalization, he lives with his mom. So his mom came and told us that he is, has been feeling sick because he stopped Xanax, taking Xanax, because he was taking street Xanax doses to get addicted, but eventually start weaning himself off. Uh, but what happened, uh, he came to her and she drove him to emergency room and she said he was just feeling nauseous, mainly GI symptoms. Uh, we, I don't recall if he has any respiratory symptoms, but he COVID negative tested in the hospital. Uh, on day five, she stopped coming, visiting him. And what we heard from the neighbors or our, our cousin that she passed away at home. Uh, most likely she had uh, uh, Takotsubo or I don't know. Uh, she passed. She passed away anyway. So we have a, a misconnect. And then he went to LTAC and came back. His cardiac and neuro function is, is as I said, is recovering, uh, but no PFO. And we couldn't tell that missing story of what happened, of what the trigger for this uh, heavy thrombone like event. So he didn't have a lengthy thrombus, right? I, no, I, to your point, yeah, there was an LV thrombus on the echo. I'm sorry, yeah, on the echo, I didn't put there, but uh, with contrast, there's a, a very a mural, um, thin layer of thrombus was seen on the echo. It wasn't yeah. big enough, yeah. Yeah, you know, what might have happened, Charlie, I think the, maybe some kind of toxic cardiomyopathy induced by the Xanax or God knows what else that gave him, gave him like a, a massive myocarditis an LV thrombus developed and then it embolized into the left main and it went all the way down in both corners um, because you didn't I, see any kind of plaque there, right? At all, at all. I mean, I did IVIS just to make sure I'm not missing anything. And to your point, I think, as you see from the LV, he has a Takotsubo a a phenomenon from the LV. So most likely he had a, a kind of a stress cardiomyopathy from whatever medication he was taking or drugs he's been taking as well as myocarditis kind of phenomenon. Yeah, because he was feeling sick for days and days, and probably he was in this nausea and vomiting. It was a low output syndrome, and that is the main presentation. And then the ACS was unfortunately just an like a complication of that. And definitely, yeah. at the age twenty nine kind of persuaded everybody from going straight to the heart. Yeah, great case, and thanks for sharing yeah, it. Yeah, no thanks. I definitely, that was definitely an exciting case. I mean, it's easy for us now to look at it, but, you know, doing it on this. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah, I mean, that's probably, and also being so young, you know, it's one thing if the old 80 year old comes in with this, but, you know, 20 something year old, I think the stress of everyone involved is so much higher because everyone obviously wants the younger people to do well, given the life expectancy. A couple Absolutely. of comments that came up is about thrombophilia workup. Was there any thrombophilia workup? But as you said, maybe it was just, if it's LV thrombus, that probably explains about what happened there as well. And, and for the audience, uh, uh, I didn't show the right side. The upright coronary was completely open as dominant RCA. And we know this is the most common, usually thrombo, thrombosis come, uh, visible, thromboembolic comes to the right side. But surprisingly, he didn't have anything on the right side. Wonderful. So, Tadi, thanks again. Phenomenal Thank case. You. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks very much for sharing with us. And then we'll move, move on to um, Dr. Kangil. So, Catherine, looking forward to uh, seeing your case. All right. Thank you so much. 
So um, I am going to share with you a very emotionally enrich enriching case. Um, you know, when you said my most exciting PCI for the last year, you know, my mind never goes to a good place. So um, I'll show you something that was a little bit painful for me to go through in the process and hopefully we can learn something along the way. So this is a 64 year old gentleman um, who comes in with um, a new diagnosis of angina. Here's his home medications. He's on one anti-anginal. Um, and so he has a non-invasive evaluation as an outpatient. Um, he has an abnormal stress test, gets a coronary CTA and has severe LAD disease as well as intermediate um, left circumflex and RCA disease and lots of severe calcification. So here's his diagnostic angiogram. Um, and you can see kind of what we're describing as a target rich environment. So we have, you know, a second obtuse marginal with a high grade lesion. And obviously what seems like probably the most um, acute culprit in the mid LAD. You see there is some proximal LAD disease. We'll come back to that. And here's the right coronary, which looks just fine. Um, he hadn't had an echo, so here's his V-gram, um, which is pretty unremarkable. And so, you know, now what? So this is, um, it's a calcified mid-LED. The calcium isn't all that bad. Um, but, you know, given the diffuse nature of the disease, multivessel PCI, um, I opted to stage the procedure and come back on another day. So. Um, here's the plan PCI in this patient. So, you know, was ultimately able to cross. It was actually a bit difficult um, to get a microcatheter across, but started ballooning and was able to IVIS. Was able to, um, you know, open this vessel adequately to pass an IVIS using a Scorflex balloon and then performed IVIS. And here you can see some still frames from that IVIS. Um, and so if you start in the bottom right of your corner, you'll see the distal LED, you'll see our distal landing zone mid LED. And then, um, you know, unfortunately, here's that proximal LED. And that's what I had planned on leaving behind. And then you can see kind of here's the osteal LED where, you know, it looked to me like there was, you know, an area that had less than 50% plaque by burden um, to potentially land a stent and then the left main. And so kind of here's the situation I was in. I said, okay, this is where I'm landing my stent. There's no ambiguity there, but you know, how far back am I bringing this stent? Are we gonna be a more is more or a less is more interventional cardiologist today? So am I doing something like that? Am I stenting more back here? Or are we coming the whole way back? And you know, having done the IVIS as is often the case by you know, those of us who do a lot of IVIS guided PCI, I opted for the red line to cover that you know, lesion that looked quite severe on IVIS. Um, you know, based on the IVIS, I thought that I had an adequate landing zone in the osteal LED and that I didn't need to cross back into the left main. So and then maybe Lorenzo and, uh, and Sadi, you agree, would you have done something different since again, geographically, it doesn't look that bad. And uh, would you have necessarily done imaging before? Because, you know, some people say you do, can do imaging after you put your stand to check the result. But here, obviously, the imaging did change the strategy completely from the get-go. I would definitely do the same imaging uh, is very critical here. It's very persuading looking at this angiogram. Uh, once you see this critical lesion between the green and the blue, uh, but definitely that doesn't mean that uh, approximately there's no disease, but pre ivising I, I always tell the text, I mean, if when I do IVIS after, let's do it before, so it's same catheter. And also it helps you when you advance the catheter, or if you're struggling to get through, that's gonna give you an idea how's your equipment gonna go forward and if you're going to be able to develop kind of heavy or bigger balloons and stents. Yeah, I agree. Uh, I would also stand uh, from uh, red to blue. Um, sometimes when it's very clear what plaque modification technique I have to use, uh, for example, a thorectomy or shockwave, um, I would skip the very baseline shot uh, imaging and run, but I would still do imaging before deciding where to stand, particularly in a case uh, with diffuse disease like this one, because you know, this proximal LED lesion is a intermediate plus. So, you know, you do an IVUS, you find out that you can't just land a stent just before that, and you need to cover up all the way up to the osteum. I think uh, so far I would have done the same as Catherine. Okay, thank you. So that was the adventure I, uh, I set myself out on. So after pre-dilating pre everything with cutting balloons, you can see here's my first stent. Here's another overlapping stent. And 
as was mentioned, I really was aiming for that osteal LED, which certainly looked fine angiographically and I thought looked pretty good on IVIS. Here you can see that result. And I was unhappy with that diagonal. As you can see, it's a very important diagonal, three large branches coming after it. And you see the os is quite pinched. So here I am post dilating a small area of under expansion. I recrossed and did kissing balloons. And that was my result. I did more proximal optimization. I ended up tacking a digital stent distally because I had landed in a bit more plaque than I preferred. Hit that one spot harder with a non-compliant balloon and was ready to give myself a high five when I looked back at that osteal diagonal and was quite disappointed to see that it was again, you know, quite stenotic. So I don't know, um, Kind of what everyone else would do at this point. I opted to go back and do non-compliant kissing balloons, understanding that I may need to end up stenting if I dissected the vessel, but really feeling like, you know, I needed to make a difference in the os of that diagonal. So just curious, and then what would, uh, yeah, so what would, uh, Lorenzo and Sadi, what would you do for this diagonal? Uh, yeah, at this point, I have to change strategies and, and descend from what you've done. I mean, even at the, before the first kissing, I think sometimes the angiographic appearance, particularly side branches, is worse than it actually is. So I'm not saying I wouldn't have done anything, but I would have done a pressure wire. Actually, yesterday in the cath lab, we had the same situation on a circumflex um, after left main provisional stenting into the LAD. Um, I was pretty convinced it would have been negative, but it was a large circumflex. It was all still pinching, did RFR, turned out 0 0.87. We did a kissing and then the RFR improved. So uh, I think physiology has a prominent role in guiding us uh, in our intervention on side branches and I would have done it here. Well, Lorenzo, thank you for that. We'll come back to that idea in a moment. <laughs> of course, again, it's always easy post hoc to find yeah, different yeah. plans, but... Uh... <laughs> First Don't worry. That... The cuff works can help too. If you have a cuff work, sometimes you can do it and get a sense yeah. of what's going on. But you right. wouldn't have a case for tonight, Catherine, otherwise. So <laughs> Yeah, well, this this was the bifurcation gift uh case that just kept giving. So um, you know, at this point in time, I decided for better or worse that I was done with this diagonal. Um and so um ended up taking this these pictures and had some feelings about the circumflex. You know, and kind of all these ideas go through your head. When you're a fellow, they teach you, you know, circum like side branches always get elliptically deformed when you have plaque shift. It always looks worse in one view than it really is. Um, and so, you know, these this is kind of the still frame of the two different views of the circumflex. And these are kind of the different options that came to my mind. I don't know um, if the panel has any strong feelings. I can tell you what I did which is what um, Lorenzo had suggested. Right, I mean, definitely it looks, uh, it's foreshortened on the right picture, but the left definitely, it, it, it's a bit better, maybe 50%. But uh, again, in geography, with, in the era of physiology and imaging, it's, uh, you can you have to do one of those, but I can tell the physiology would answer that question. Yeah, so, you know, I was obviously, I was, I wished I was happier in geographically, but, you know, I trust trust physiology and um, and was kind of happy with how this physiology looked. And um, and I called it a day at the time. So this was the end of that case, which wasn't the easiest case. Um, so, you know, 124 minutes of sedation, 200 cc's of contrast and a gray. And so um, I do my next case. And while I'm in my next case, I get a call from the recovery room that the Patient from case number one is having nausea, vomiting. Can I get an order from, from Maalox? I said, sure. Can we also check an EKG? This is the EKG. So, um, you know, and the patient had also just taken 600 milligrams of Plavix. So, you know, at the time I said, okay, have your Maalox um, and we'll go from there. And so, you know, he's fine. And so then I move on to case number three um, and he's better. But during that next case, I get a call. He's He's vomiting again. Can I get an order for Zofran? And I said, okay, can I get another EKG while we're at it? Um, and again, really normal EKG. But I went back and I saw the patient um, between cases because just 
this just, I had uneasy feeling about the circumflex despite the normal physiology. And he just didn't look right. He was uncomfortable appearing. He said, and he's like, I get this when I take pills on an empty stomach, I just feel really nauseous. And so, um, you know, I, I guess the panel can probably guess what I did, which was bring, bring the patient back to the cath lab. 100%. And, I mean, yeah. we had the situations what? before uh, between losing the PTY12 inhibitor as well as you are really knowing the anatomy that you had a pinched diag as well as borderline circ. It's time to take him back. When was the platys given? Uh, before the case started. So when he got on the table. So two two hours and four minutes before the end of the case. Mm. So yeah, in my planned PCIs, I tend to, you know, when they get into the room, I'll give them a load of platys before they get on the table. No, no, of course. And just thinking, yeah, I mean, this was prior dissection of the circumflex induced by the stent, but EKG was totally normal, mm -hmm. both of them. Um, yeah. I don't know if he just got upset, stomach upset, and like he said, vomited, and then that the absence of P two I twelve inhibition triggered that with a substrate that was facilitating, which is the dissection, probably. Yeah, um, you know, I I had, I didn't, I actually didn't have a wire in the circumflex, though. Certainly, that osteal LED scent could have you know, shifted or dissected something, you know, but nothing that I had appreciated, you know, I, I was calling it plaque shift before. So, you know, I've gone back and really looked, um, but I think, you know, I was misled by the physiology on this case. And so, and as you'll recall, one of the reasons I was hesitant to stent back into the left main initially was because there was an additional circumflex lesion right that you know after today i was like we'll deal with that on another day that's another problem so i restored flow and um you know you can see here in the this is just a still from the osteo circ ivis um, and it really to me looked like significant plaque shift um, and you know native disease um, but again this is kind of low definition ivis so not the highest quality imaging so you know at this point in time we're we're doing it all. We're we're gonna have to now we're committed. We'll be doing, you know, the rest of this gentleman's complete revascularization today. So, you know, get a big balloon, restore flow. Um, you know, I like to use at least a 3-0 to go around the corner to really just move everything around the out of the way and get some flow back. You can see here I struggled a little bit with calcium and expansion in that distal um lesion, but ultimately was able to get everything, um, get everything dealt with. And so the next question I had was, well, how am I going to deal with the left main, right? Because I know I have some plaque extending into the distal left main. Um, I've already shut down the circumflex once because this matters in this moment because where I land this circumflex stent is going to dictate what strategy I'm going to do for my left main stenting. Am I just going to leave the LED scent where it is, or am I just going to do the whole thing and cover everything? And so I don't know, you may be able to tell that I brought it back a little bit here because I'll, I'll ultimately be doing a crush strategy, but I don't know if anyone else would have done it differently and left the left main alone. Um, this is like a difficult scenario because uh, you are committed to provisional from the LAD PCI. At this point, uh, there is no um, standing strategy that can give you a good result because if you just drop a stand in the circumflex as V stenting, you're most likely going to leave some plaque and cover on either the left main, the LAD, or the circumflex. If you cross over into the left main, there is going to be like one millimeter or two in the polygon of confluence that has no stand on the LAD side. Um, so, you know, there is no, no easy solution here. Another thought that I want to bring to the attention of the panelists, the, what about the uh, antiplatelet therapy? Did you give a, a cantilever in this situation with the patient vomiting and the thrombotic event? I didn't, I didn't. We don't have, um, I, we just don't give a ton of cantilever and I'll be honest, I didn't think of it. Um, I was more viewing this as a mechanical problem than uh, an antiplatelet therapy problem because I actually don't think he vomited up the pills um, per nursing. I think it was just kind of some dry spittle sort of stuff. Um, so I didn't, but that's certainly something that I could have done and maybe would do again if I had 
had this case to do. I would do lots of things different, Lorenzo, if I had this case to do again. I think that um, the general role is regardless if the cause was the vomiting or not, if you have a mm -hmm. complex lesion with thrombus involved, uh, more often than not, is before entering the lab, I don't know why I have it on top of my head and I often use it in these complex scenarios. Um, and, you know, you can just, uh, you know, tick that off in your checklist because you're not going to have a thrombotic event due to an insufficient antiplatelet therapy. Or you might have thrombosis because of low ACT, but you know in this patient the stakes were high and and he had a thrombotic event. I don't know, Manos and Chadi, what you guys think. I mean, I'm really yeah. concerned when 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 somebody is nauseous and throwing up. I mean, with the plavix, we know it's absorption, even given before the case. Just to, as you said, just you don't want to have nightmare. Check that box. In terms of the technique here, I mean, Catherine, I, mean, I think you're doing the right thing, and you don't want to you want to leave nothing. Uh, you have already issues with the situation. You want to come up with the best strategy and give him the ultimate result. Uh, so you can go, go to bed at night uh, sleeping well. So in this case, I would definitely uh, proceed either with DK crush or, um, or some mechanism just to cover all the way to the left main and reconstruct the carina and um, to avoid any uh, black shift or any uh, kind of uh, miss uh, uh, uncovered or geographic miss. Yeah, no, I think you managed it very well. Now, the one challenge, I think right now there is probably, what, five, six millimeters of stand protruding into the left main. So the challenge of that is doing pot might be an issue if you don't have enough stand over there. But actually, here, what I would do is similar to yours, is a provisional technique. I think it's sometimes it's very hard to nail that ostium of the circ if you're trying to nail it and make sure you're there, that V standing that Lorenzo mentioned. So uh, trying to go essentially provisional from the left main into the circ uh, you are likely to have an issue in the LAD. And I think not covering that few millimeters at the top, I guess the almost the carine doesn't matter that much because there's not, not much disease there to start with. So doing exactly this provisional with maybe a little more stand in the main and doing a pot there, that might be all that you need. Actually, I would be more concerned for that first obtuse margin that seems to have maybe an osteo lesion and might get pinched with the stand. But again, I think it's managed very well. You got the flow, you moved on. Kangri or 2B3A might have helped, but I think you're doing uh, phenomenal work here. See it. It's so good to talk with the panel. You see all my problems before I saw them. So, yeah, so I deployed the stent, um, and I had planned at this point in time, I was going to do a DK crush, so to add another stent from the LAD into the left main to just control the entire situation. But, of course, now you see this massive obtuse marginal um, and again, because my eyes are really on that circumflex, but now you can see that marginal really is filling with Timmy 2 flow, which is quite disappointing. And I've been really struggling with every single bifurcation in this poor man's coronary tree for the last hours, many hours. So I ballooned it with a 2-0. My goal here was to get good flow, Timmy 3 flow. And that was kind of what we got. And so then I kind of moved on with my um, left main stenting. And you can see here... You know, I'm lining up my stent from the LED to left main to kind of move move on with my crush technique, recross, side main kiss with non-compliant balloons, um, followed by a pot. And, you know, at this point in time, really wanting to be done with this case. But, of course, you know, that marginal is just torturing me. And I, you know, certainly am not looking forward to coming back again for another shutdown side branch. So um, again, rewired through everything, um, did, uh, you know, my goal in this case was I didn't want to, you know, put more metal into this area. So I thought, you know, an undersized semi-compliant balloon for a prolonged inflation, which is, I understand what they did back in the, uh, the days before stents, um, you know, to restore flow, and kind of get us through the end of this case. And here you can see what we look like after that, which, you know, I thought was acceptable um, going forward. And you can see actually here that diagonal has plumped up nicely that I was concerned about in the beginning. So, you know, this is the end of the case, another 200 of contrast, another two hours in the cath lab. Um, I learned a lot of lessons. Um, you know, I think the big thing is I'm, I'm pretty fast to, um, these days to take someone back to the cath lab for nausea and vomiting, in, even with an unchanged EKG. I think, um, you know, 
sending a patient like this to the unit would have been a mistake or to a floor bed would have been a mistake. So um, I think kind of that was my big takeaway. And, you know, I think before this case, I really trusted that IFR of the side branch in my kind of questionable side branch. Um, and I think I trusted a little less after this case. And I think I'll... Great, great case. And thanks for, for being vulnerable and sharing it, Catherine. So I tend to agree with the first three lessons that you mentioned. Uh, the fourth one, however, uh, I think if the problem was, I mean, if you have plaque shift, the, the FFR, RFR, whatever, is going to be positive or negative, depending on that. I think what you had was that dissection, and that's why it thrombos down. So if you, I mean, if anything, you might make a point, I should have imaged the circumflex. Uh, I, I don't know if I would have imaged the circumflex, but I don't think that the it was the IFR that betrayed you. I think it was a dissection, not a plaque shift. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I think I'll definitely be more critical, you know, and look for dissections. But yeah. So again, we have many, a few questions from the audience before we move on. Uh, one is about uh, um, uh, how the patient was doing. So wh while all this is happening at the side branches and everything, was the patient okay on the table, or was he not feeling very well, or? So he was hemodynamically a rock through all of this, which was, you know, the one the one thing I got off a little bit easy in this case. He had lots of chest pain and nausea um, on the table, which we kind of got him fairly deeply sedated and de to deal with that. But he uh, he felt it. Perfect. And again, I mean, I think probably for me the biggest lesson from this case is the clinical acumen. I think the best move was when you saw the patient not feeling well, as you said, the gut reaction. Um, you don't lose anything to take a diagnostic angiogram. You know, if you are wrong, you didn't lose anything, a few cc's of contrast and an access point. But if you are correct, as it was in this case, you really uh, saved the, big, the patient a lot. Because imagine you left him go, and then at 2 a.m., now he's starting getting hemodynamic issues or other issues, and then it becomes much more challenging to treat. So I think your uh, clinical acumen, looking at the patient and say he needs more more uh, more attention. I think that's what was the key lesson, and I think very important for everyone attending. Perfect. So again, thanks so much, Catherine. Great case. Uh, due to time, let's move on to last but not least. So Lorenzo, uh, looking forward to your case. Thanks, Manus. Um, I guess you can see my screen now. So I have to say that this is uh, by any means. Uh, it is not the most ch technically challenging case that I had this year. I think there was a, it's a combination of a clinical satisfaction by how in the end the case uh, and the, the, the patient pathway in the healthcare system went and also some, some drama um, during the case, um, one of the procedures at least. So um, thanks for allowing me to share it. So this is a 72 year old uh, East African man with several cardiovascular risk factor. He had some uh, fistulas in the arms because uh, he will, he had ESRD in the past. Status post renal transplant now. Renal function is normal and presents at an outside hospital with um, uh, not clinically very clear uh, picture of altered mental status hypoglycemia. It was found out some work up to uh, be suffering from AKI and, and standing, but the patient was completely <clears throat> asymptomatic for chest pain or dyspnea, and he didn't have any heart failure symptom. Uh, an echo was done, LDF was borderline normal, and the rest was normal, and uh, a diagnosis of three-vessel uh, CAD was made. And so, as you can see here, um, he has a proximal RCA CTO with severe calcium burden here, um, and then he also has severely, very severely calcified left coronary uh, with, uh, as you can see here, involvement of the osteal circumflex, severe diffuse disease um, in the first margin of the second margin. It's not a huge vessel. And as you can see here, it might be even occluded, but a distal vessel is pretty small. And he also, and, and the RFR was positive here in the first large OM1. And uh, the LED disease was not overwhelming, but the RFR was very, very significant, a 0 0.41. So we have this case now. Um, Syndex score is in the highest third tile, 38. Um, SDS score is 2.2. Uh, 
Um, honestly, I have to say that I calculated the score for the presentation because of the patient was very adamant on not getting cabbage and getting PCI instead. So these are the setup shots on the first procedure um, from transfemoral axis uh, that put a bit in better evidence this mid to proximal LED disease and what we just saw uh, on the left um, circumflex. So since there was severe calcification, we proceeded with rotational atherectomy, one five burr in the LAD. The vessel proximal was very big. Um, and so we went for a, a 2 burr. Um, we might have argued that in 2023, we could have done shockwave. Um, I think this was done mainly also because we are responsible of training fellows. So we have to expose them to all possible plaque modification technique. And they were uh, a bit low on rota. So we did the rota here. And uh, as you can see, a quick question, end, Lorenzo, maybe to the other panelists, how often do you do roto with the two bear? Not often. <laughs> I don't have rota. Usually, we do uh, orbital CSI. Yeah, I think yeah. I mean the two bear is uh, fairly. You know, it's. I think it's a little. Uh, I mean, in this case, the vessel is large, so it should be okay. But yeah, it's something that is done infrequently. Uh, and I guess the main thing for me is the risk of entrapment. This might be a little more likely to get entrapped um than the smaller ones but i mean you never know yeah i agree um i think the decision was driven by what i just mentioned about the fellow training and i agree i, I don't use the the tuber much anymore but fortunately uh, this is not what uh, caused the drama uh is the tuber <laughs> this is all good as you can see here the angio check was uh was completely normal and i just put it because uh, then it's not going to be normal anymore um we do. We had the bear open from the uh, LAD, so we do uh, RA on the circumflex uh, and OM1 with a one five bear. And this is just the first passage. Usually, the first passage what I do is uh, a shorter run just to make sure that there is no issue. So I do an angio check afterwards, and surprisingly, the LAD goes down. Okay, no reflow or dissection on the LAD. So I was very surprised. Um, it ex it happened maybe once or twice in my career that the side branch goes down after burring uh, on another vessel. It never happened with the osteal LAD. So I thought maybe some kind of embolic phenomenon from some calcium. It's true there might be some dissection of the circumflex there. But anyway, the patient that was uh, you know, completely asymptomatic before becomes hypertensive, chest pain, ST elevation, he becomes agitated. We have to insert an impella emergently. He had some valve calcifications, valve sclerosis only in the aortic valve, but these um, does, uh, that, uh, did not allow the impella to glide through the valve easily. So we um, probably interfered with the aortic valve opening. The patient went into PEA, PEA arrest, coded, who was uh, resuscitated after 10 minutes of CPR. And you can see here we have still very slow flow in the LAD. And so I thought initially it was a no reflow. So I put a dual lumen catheter in the LAD, injected it under micrograms of intracoronary epinephrine, nothing changed. Then I said, you know, differential diagnosis most likely caused at this point is dissection. So I ballooned. And in fact, the vessel came back uh, with the vigorous TME3 flow immediately. So it was probably a dissection. Um, so, so Lorenzo, can I ask you a question? So once you lost the flow, then how difficult was the rewiring? And then are you concerned when this happens that you've rotablated the LAD? Could you go subindimal and then, you know, balloon it or make it worse potentially? Yeah, well, so the first thing, uh, if I remember correctly, I had to pull the guide out and put the impella. So I I would have, I lost everything because I had to put the impella in. I only had one axis. So then I, um, I think I got a second axis and then this is from a second femoral axis. So I had to rewire, as you pointed out. There was no difficulty whatsoever, but there was a, I just went in with no, with no microcatheter and a run through wire. The wire went fine. Um, and, um, and then um, I don't remember, I, did, I didn't eye at the moment, but the wire moved very easily and I even engaged the septal. So, you know, I was sure I was in the true lumen, but yeah, it's a fair point because if it was a big dissection, could have been very hard to re rewire. So Lorenzo, do you think the, the ampulla and the shock that helps the flow or is it the epinephrine that you gave or a combination of both? 
so the patient came back with the impella because he was, uh, you know, with very low blood pressure after the 10 minutes of code. I, I think in general, if it's in a no reflow, the impella helps a lot. Uh, still, the LED went down, so the, the shock was, uh, the, the impella was instrumental. The epinephrine did not do anything. It, the vessel did not come back, and the pressure remained more, I mean, it increased transiently, but then went back uh, to, you know, soft blood pressure until I got this open. So we just sent the LED into the left main. We, uh, we optimize it. We pot it. Um, we fortunately did not give a lot of contrast, uh, 120 milliliters. Fluoroscopy time was 25 uh, mil, uh, minutes. The patient was extubated the next day. Impella was removed the next day. The patient was fortunately um, discharged seven days later. As you can see on, on the right side of the panel, the, uh, the IVUS at the end of the procedure was good. So at this point, we had to complete a revascularization. Um, hey, Lorenzo, I yes. see this, the osteal circuit looks weird. It reminds me of Catherine's case, but I guess fortunately <laughs> you did not have uh, an issue here, right? No, I, th I think that when there is so much calcium, it might look funky, but uh, it rarely goes down. And anyway, I decided very, I was very clear. It was very clear in my mind. We're not going to do, when you have a complication, you should just try to get the patient off the table in a safe way. This is stable disease. If it closes down, we will have a good reason to go in again. But, you know, after this emotionally enriching uh, experience, it, the goal is just to, you know, cool off. And in fact, it paid off because <clears throat> we brought him back 18 days later. Everything is exactly the same as we left it. So again, transfemoral, uh, anticipating a lot of difficulty with support and advancing gear. So the plan was at this point, since we had a stent in the left main, of course, to try to do balloon-based plaque modification with IVL into the circumflex O and OM1. So we created some room with shockwave tool and C does not expand. Um, there's a tortuosity at the OM1 often. 360 degrees of calcium is uh, a why we cannot get stuff in. <clears throat> and so the balloon, of course, is underexpanded. A wall ring would not cross. Score would barely get in. And due to the tortuosity, we, we just stop. So at that point, I even tried balloon anchoring the LED stand because the LDF was normal. The patient was uh, enduring it um, pretty nicely to try to push forcefully the shockwave through the uh, ostium of the OM1. You can see eight French lung sheath. Uh, regardless, the shockwave cannot go in. Uh, of note, a uh, fun fact, the patient also... Uh, did not, was very adamant. He didn't want a uh, rotational thoracotomy anymore because he was traumatized and rightfully so. And I was, of course, a bit wary of using Rhoda. Um, so then we opened the stent strut in the left main, brought a guide liner coast through the ostium of the circumflex uh, to deliver shockwave. Uh, but the shockwave cannot go any further than that. And the vessel, as you can see, is much more calcified even further down. And the shock was not expanding. So at this point, uh, regardless how of how many I, shocks did you give, how many pulses did you give? I, I don't remember, but since I could not bring it further down, um, you know, uh, even uh, I don't know if I I tried a new shock with balloon, but there was so much more area of calcium that I had to treat, honestly. So um, you cannot make a point. Oh, you just drop a stand there because there was a lot of plaque distally. So I needed more plaque modification. And so, you know, uh, I said, uh, we're going to bring a guideliner coast through the stent strap, protect the stent, and just drill it with the rotoblader, one five burr. And uh, usually 99.9% .9 of the time, I use Dynaglide to go up, but this interacts, the burr with Dynaglide interacts with the push rod of the guide extension. So I just uh, went manually and then activated Dyna when I was completely inside the guide extension. Manos and the others, do you have any uh, insight here? Anything differently at this point? Well, I think I mean, I, the, I, the guideliner course is a very useful one. I think it has this coiting and delivers very well through these very challenging <laughs> angles. So I think that's a great idea. And I agree with you. I would not activate it inside the inside the, the guide catheter. Um, the other option here, I mean, obviously you had to do something dramatic, is to try the very high pressure balloon maybe. But you might have had similar challenges with delivery. It's not as deliverable either. So... I don't know, Chadi, you wanted to say something? Yeah, I mean, for, for the road, I mean, again, I don't have experience, but in these tortuous cases, I mean, you, you want to advance the guideliner to avoid as much turns in the vessel, especially in the OM, 
because an orbital atherectomy, as you know, it has the highest rate for perforation or dissection because of the, orb uh, how, the way it's a spinning. But usually advancing a guideliner close enough to the lesion, number one, help you with delivery, two, minimize how, the, the, how it's going to be turning on and ejecting out of the guide. The closer you are in the uh, lesion is safer. I, I like Lorenzo's approach of trying to essentially stand on your head to avoid having to do this is exactly what I would have done. Um, I OM1 specifically, I use a lot of wiggle wire there. Like this is a case where I think pulling out a wiggle wire can sometimes change the game a little bit. Um, you know, it's not a wire that I, I used a ton, um, but kind of as a, an attending have really adopted. And I think OM1 with calcium is, is a great spot. Yeah, there was someone who brought up uh, why not laser. Yeah, we thought about that. Uh, laser, I think it's good uh, when you have um, some like focal spot of fibrotic lesion, but it would have not deliver probably. And I don't think it's gonna. It would have been able to actually uh, modify all the calcium that it needed. It was a very very uh, long segment, and um, I don't think it would have made a difference. So that's why I went for Rhoda. So, so you think next you can go with the shock? You think you only open the pathway, you can go with the shock wave again? Yes. In fact, uh, uh, to your point, balloons now cross and expand very easily. And I was able, uh, I think I, I used the shock wave afterwards because I still had some, some shocks. Then, uh, long story short, we dropped some stents in the OM1, put another one at the circumflex tossing with a tap with the old left main stand, kiss and pot. And then we have a, a decent final result with low contrast volume. So anything weird? Do you see anything weird here, guys? Manus? So uh... the, the, there's some, you know, this to the distal edge of the stand into that OM. It looks like a big step down. Now it could just be the size of the vessel, but just looks a little funny there. Mm -hmm. um, the others. How about the 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 oxtail uh, stents LAD and circ? I cannot see it very well. Mm -hmm. You you didn't put uh, a, you didn't extend to the left main stent, right? You just did. A... Yeah. What was the technique you used for the ostium? It looks uh, like there's a short stent into the. Yeah, main. It, it looks like you have longitudinal compression. Bingo. Yeah. yeah, I did yeah. tap with the old stand, but you see, there's no more left main stand. Yeah. I mean, it became yeah. like a kind of a crash V. And in fact, I had, yeah. as I always do everything at the end, and it was a longitudinal stand deformation in the left main. It's not too bad on eye, which the MSA is huge. Um, so it would have involved uh, like a complex uh, stenting with putting yet, yet another layer of metal. So I decided to leave it alone. The osteal circumflex had a reasonable MSA for a circumflex. Also, this this person was a, of a shorter stature. So it was, uh, um, um, you know, the, all these MSAs threshold are not indexed. I felt that 5.6 was enough. But yeah, you're right, Catherine. There was a, a longitudinal stand deformation in the uh, in the left main and that we decided to leave alone because it looked reasonable. The patient came back. Almost a the guide extension, right? It was the guide extension yes. causing this, right? In fact, when I was preparing the case, I went back to the images and you can see that it was the moment when we went with the guideliner calls that, or I don't know if it was the guideliner calls or some sometimes that we tried to push stuff and uh, vigorously into the circumflex and the guide or guide extension damaged the left main stand. Um, brought the patient back for 27 days later. Uh, real uh, bi bifemoral setup, the CT of the LA, of the RCA short taper stamp, the distal vessel lights up up to the mid, proximal to mid uh, portion. There are some collaterals. Uh, this is real time wiring, turnpike spiral and gladius mongo gets easily through into a side branch. We bring the micro catheter through, we redirect with a workhorse wire. We're able to um, wire the distal RCA. Since we had the true to true crossing, um, we did orbital atherectomy here, a few passages, and then we stented with a couple stents all the way up to the ostium. We also flashed it um, to make sure that the stent was well flared at the ostium. And this is the final result. MSA is nice, 120 milliliters of contrast. 
And so just some final consideration. Oh yeah, so here we checked again the left corner and everything was uh, like we left it the last time. It looks like a bit weird here, but um, so far the result was held holding. Of course, it was just one month follow-up. Total radiation over two months was less than one gray, thanks to our X-ray system, um, but also because the patient was uh, very like small. It was like uh, 147, I think, in, in height and uh, 147 uh, meters and like 56 kilos. No PCI resulting in AKI. We only had that uh, noriflow versus dissection uh, as a complication during the first case. There was a, a high um, uh, adrenaline environment because it required uh, impelling surgery due to cardiogenic shock and and, um, and and cardiac arrest. The patient is doing well a three month follow up that he just completed. And these are the discussion points. I leave them there for, for all the panel because I think I learned a lot from this case. It brings up a lot of points uh, that deserve discussion. So yeah, let's go uh, and discuss it. Yeah, thanks, Rachel. I think, you know, again, many lessons, as you say, and I think most people would have said, you know, the RCA is going to be the tough one and the risk there, but actually it was not. Yeah, um, I think another lesson is that thorectomy does carry risks. There's no question about it. And uh, in this case, it was kind of unusual, as you said, to have the main vessel shut down. But I suspect it wasn't the atherectomy in the diagonal. I think it might have been that during the original uh, run in the LAD, it got disrupted. And then once you lost the wire, maybe the vessel collapsed. And that's one of the downsides, I guess, of having to remove the wire to do the atherectomy on the side, Brandt. But um, uh, Catherine, Sadi, any any other thoughts? Yeah, this, the first question, uh, Azalini, I, I think it's... Uh... I, I wouldn't start with the RCA first because I think, uh, um, I mean, I would start with the donor vessel. And then again, it's, uh, the, I think that's the main territory of the myocardium that's involved. And I think this most likely I'm assuming this is the symptomatic, he's symptomatic from this compared to the CTO area. Um, but definitely in terms of the technique, uh, as you said, you have to be savvy with all the tools and equipment for severely calcified lesion. Um, shockwave, definitely it's taking momentum, but they show out a nice illustration of sometimes deliverability is a problem in these bulky, semi-bulky uh, balloons. And uh, rotor shock is kind of uh, an approach which is, I mean, often used in these situations, especially in tertiary hospital like OM and, and circumflex. Yeah, I mean, I think um, I think being facile and, and quick on your feet, this is just like a, a complete showcase of that, you know. I. I feel like we, I watched so many cases and I would say this could have all been avoided with drilling up front. But I think in this case, kind of the first challenge was from drilling and the second challenge was from trying to do too many things before drilling. So I think, I think it just reinforces one more time that if you're going to take on these cases and do them well, like obviously Lorenzo has expertly shown, you just have to be ready for kind of whatever, whatever comes because um, that's kind of what we encounter in this business. Wonderful. And on this note, again, I'd like to thank you. I know we're a few minutes uh, past uh, 9 o'clock or 10 o'clock Eastern time. Uh, excellent cases. A lot of learning in this case. Trust your gut. Be ready for tackling the unpredictable, the things that don't happen. And um, that can help optimize the outcomes of the patient. And also having the hemodynamic support available, I think that can play a huge role both in the first case but also in the last case as well. I would like to thank one more time our sponsors uh, Abbott, uh, Metronic and Shockwave and thank again uh, Chadi and Catherine and Lorenzo. Thank you so much and thank all the viewers for uh, uh, joining us tonight. Thank you so much. Thank you Manos. Thank you for having us. Thanks everyone. Bye.